Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Today we're going to talk about evolution, but specifically evolution as it relates to underground trains, and even more specifically, their interiors. You know, a nice broad topic with wide appeal to the casual viewer. The thing is, tube trains have a very different interior layout to normal trains. The reason is, quite simply, capacity. The Underground is an intensive metro service, but the engineers who originally designed the trains had never worked with anything like this before, so there was a long process of improvement to get to where we are today. So how did we get here? Well, as I like to do, we're going to go right back to the beginning, to the very first railway carriages. In the early days of trains, they based their carriages on, well, carriages, as in horse-drawn carriages. It made sense. Trains were, after all, fulfilling much the same functions as the old stagecoaches. Seating was set crossways so that the passengers could face each other. Third-class carriages were more akin to goods wagons, a bare wooden interior, no roof, sometimes no seats. Second-class coaches were somewhere in between, typically at least including a roof. As the railways evolved, coaches grew larger and moved away from the stagecoach layout to become their own distinct thing. They became larger. Third-class coaches gained roofs, and the layout was set. Each coach was divided up into compartments. Each compartment had doors. In the early days of the underground, that's what passengers got. The Metropolitan Railway, when it first opened in 1863, used rolling stock from the Great Western Railway. The two companies fell out, and the Metropolitan ended up buying its own coaches. These were basically just conventional mainline coaches, the only significant difference being that they had doors that were rounded at the top so they wouldn't get knocked on the tunnel roof if they had to be opened between stations. The concept of an underground railway didn't really exist. The Metropolitan saw itself as a mainline railway with an underground section. The Hammersmith and City Railway and the District Railway, both spin-offs of the Metropolitan Railway effectively, took the same approach. The first major deviation from the norm came with a line that no longer exists, the Tower Subway. This might have been, depending how you class these things, the first deep-level tube railway. It opened in 1870 and the service ended a little less than five months later. It crossed the river near where Tower Bridge is now and consisted of a single cable-hauled carriage. This is what the interior looked like. Now, this is very deceptive. In reality, the rails were only two feet six inches apart. Space was at a premium. So it's no surprise that here we see sideways seating. Before we get into the 1890s and things really start to kick into gear, I think this is a good time to bring up today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. You see, it's a little known fact that before I was a YouTuber, I was actually a private detective with an office on Baker Street. This is definitely Baker Street. That all changed when I was asked to track a man down for a client. But be warned, she says. He has Surfshark. Now she tells me. It used to be that tracking a guy's online presence was easy. But with Surfshark's advanced encryption and servers in over a hundred countries, he could set his location to anywhere. He could be watching streaming services from all over the world and getting region-specific pricing when shopping online. And there is nothing we can do. And by clicking the link below and entering the code JAGO, anyone could do the same and get three months extra free. That very day, I quit the detective game, got on the tube at the nearest station, which as you can see was Baker Street, of course, and started a new life. But good luck catching that guy, anyway. If you don't class the Tower Subway as London's first deep-level tube railway, then I refer you to the city in South London, which opened in 1890. This, similarly, was very small by the standard of Victorian trains. I know that at least some of the engineering staff on this had worked on the Tower Subway, most notably James Greathead, the designer of the Tunnelling Shield and a great advocate for underground railways. It wouldn't surprise me if the layout of the Tower Subways, for want of a better word, carriage, influenced that of the City and South London Railways coaches. These coaches gained the unflattering nickname of Padded Cells, because not only did they feature lengthwise benches against the walls, but they had no windows, only these odd little slits. The City and South London Railways reasoning was theoretically sound. The passenger carrying parts of the line were all in tunnel. No view, no windows. But they hadn't considered human nature. Having no windows made the carriages feel closed in and uncomfortable. So, future carriages had windows. Another key innovation was that the City and South London Railway did not divide its carriages by class. 
there was no separate first-class seating. And finally, it had bars that standing passengers could hold on to. I mean, it wasn't as if standing passengers were entirely new to railway design. Remember, those early third-class coaches didn't even have seats. But what was new was making it an integral part of the carriage design, a desirable feature rather than an expression of contempt. In 1920, the next big thing arrived on the Piccadilly line. This was the 1920 stock, which had air-powered sliding doors. Prior to this, the way you got on and off a tube train was via balconies at the end. These were each staffed by a gate man. Air-powered doors that could be operated remotely by a guard meant that a lot of staff could be disposed of, but it also sped up loading and unloading times. The standard seat layout in tube carriages tended to be a mix of longitudinal and latitudinal, or across the carriage and down the carriage if you prefer. The idea was that if you were making short journeys you'd be happy to sit sideways or stand, but if you wanted to make longer journeys you'd find sitting sideways uncomfortable. In fact, in the 1920s there was this idea to extend the Hampstead Tube, now part of the Northern Line, up to Luton. One of the reasons this concept was nixed was because the company thought they'd need to buy new trains with completely latitudinal seating. You can see this layout today on the Thameslink trains, which of course do run up to Luton. The prototype trains, known as the 1935 stock, and the production trains, known as the 1938 stock, could offer a little more room. Previous trains had great big chunky motors that took up a significant portion of the driving carriage. These ones had motors below the floor. The 1967 stock, built for the Victoria Line, experimented with the concept of driverless trains. To that end, the trains were built with no access to the driver's cab from the outside of the train. As it turned out, they did use drivers, but those drivers had to go through the carriage to get to their cabs. Not an ideal situation, and the subsequent 1972 and 1973 stock trains had cab side doors. The 1992 Central Line stock did away with seats facing the direction of travel altogether. Now, it wasn't the first stock to do this. The 1973 stock on the Piccadilly Line has the same layout due to the need to accommodate luggage on trains to and from Heathrow Airport. But it is worth noting that nearly all trains subsequent to the 1992 stock copied this concept. The only new trains that don't are the S8 stock, and the reason for that is because they operate on the Metropolitan Line, which feels a lot more like a conventional railway in terms of speed, distance, and distance between stops. The 2009 stock trains introduced on the Victoria Line in, well, 2009, were built in line with the Rail Vehicle Accessibility Regulations. This, to put it simply, means that they are designed to be more accessible for those with disabilities. There's space for wheelchairs and pushchairs, and dot matrix displays for better wayfinding. Returning to the S8 stock, it and the S7 stock introduced in 2010 were fairly revolutionary. The S stock was a standard type of train for use on the District, Circle, Hammersmith and City and Metropolitan lines. What they brought to the table was a walk-through layout, where each carriage has open ends that allow passengers to move from one part of the train to the other. They are also the first tube trains with air conditioning for passengers. Underground trains have come a long way, and this isn't even the whole story. We've gone from wooden compartment coaches on the Metropolitan Railway to walk-through air-conditioned trains on the Metropolitan Line. And no doubt the future will bring us even more changes. Tell you what, I'll release a part two in 2183. Well, I do hope you enjoyed this evolutionary tale from the tube. If so, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, as well as here on YouTube, for your support. You are the cushion to my seat. Thanks also to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Check out the link in the description below to take advantage of their offer. And I'll see you all again very soon for another Tale from the Tube.